An enzyme that could help the 700 million people who suffer from chronic kidney disease around the world. A study of pharmacy deserts in America's biggest cities. How discarded ostrich shells could help rewrite the history of our early African ancestors. And the results of the Morton Arboretum's 2020 tree census. Joining us now to help explain all of these stories is Rabia Amayas, Vice President of Education at the Museum of Science and Industry. Rabia, welcome back. So scientists in Australia have identified an enzyme that could help the millions of people, as we just mentioned, around the world who suffer from chronic kidney disease. What do we know about the number of people who have this and why these numbers are rising? So kidneys are incredibly important. Um, they filter waste and fluid from our body. They help control blood pressure, among other things. And it's been estimated that about 700 million people um, which is 10% of the world's population might suffer from chronic kidney disease. And increases in recent decades have been attributed to things like obesity and diabetes, as well as high blood pressure. So things with genetic predispositions, as well as things that have environment and lifestyle factors. So this enzyme is called NED42. What does it do? That's right. So NED42 um, has been found to regulate the pathway um, that takes place in our kidneys that helps reabsorb sodium. So this is something that's really important. It happens in all of us every day that ensures that there's the correct levels of salt in our body. Um, and this was a study done in mice. And what they found was that when that enzyme NED42 is reduced or inhibited, it leads to increased absorption of salt, which can result in kidney damage. Okay, so this discovery then, how might it help scientists develop treatments to uh, help curb chronic kidney disease? Yeah, so like all studies in mice, there's a way to go before we can learn what it means in humans. But the, the researchers hypothesized that this might mean that in many of those 700 million people with kidney disease, it may be that they have low or malfunctioning NED42 enzymes. So if there's a way to correct those levels, maybe we could treat or even reverse kidney disease, which would be an incredibly important finding. So a study out of uh, the University of Southern California has found that one third of neighborhoods in the largest 30 cities in the U.S. have pharmacy deserts that contribute to health care dispar uh, disparities. How did they define a pharmacy desert and what are those disparities that they found? Yeah, so this study looked at something that many of us might take for granted, right? How close is a pharmacy to your home? And so they defined pharmacy deserts as neighborhoods where the average distance to a pharmacy was one mile. Um, or if you're in a neighborhood where there are more households of people who don't have their own car, half a mile. So the idea of how easy is it for you to get to a pharmacy? And what they found was that the prevalence of these pharmacy deserts varies pretty widely across cities. It could, in some cities, fewer than 10% of neighborhoods were considered pharmacy desert. And in other cities, more than 60% of the neighborhoods in a city were considered pharmacy deserts. Um, and one of the other findings was that across all of the cities, segregated Black or Latino neighborhoods were more likely to be pharmacy deserts than those that are more racially diverse or those that are white. And I can guess, but what did researchers find when they looked at the data for Chicago? Yeah, so sadly, those disparities were the greatest in Chicago. They were also pronounced in cities like Los Angeles and Baltimore and Philadelphia, for example. But um, in Chicago, about 1% of neighborhoods um, that are predominantly white were pharmacy deserts, where as closer to 30%, almost 35% of black neighborhoods were considered pharmacy deserts in Chicago. So significant disparities here. What do researchers uh, suggest can be done to improve the situation to address these racial disparities? So this study is talking about pharmacies, um, but I think it really underscores all of the overwhelming evidence of how important it is to invest in neighborhoods and communities whether it's food deserts, absence of green space, et cetera. And so um, the researchers proposed that this work could really support policy and business decisions to make sure that more pharmacies are um, becoming neighborhood anchors for the things people need every day for their health care. We'll try and get to green space in a minute, but first we have to talk about ostrich shells because discarded <laughs> ostrich shells could help unravel the history of our early African ancestors. How is that? So I love this show. I learned so many things. So <laughs> there are apparently something called middens, um, which are kind of garbage dumps um, of, you know, civilizations um, past. And so one of the things that's commonly found in these middens in areas of Africa are ostrich shells. 
um, ostrich eggshells, excuse me. Ostriches are really rich in protein and are, were commonly eaten. And so um, this particular study used a technique called uranium thorium dating um, and found that there was a midden, one of these garbage dumps that has been found, was found several years ago, um, was deposited there between 119 and 113,000 years ago. Um, that's around the time that humans were believed to have moved from becoming, uh, from being hunters gatherers to more settled populations. And that's middens with a D, not with a T, as in not the ones that you put on your hands in the winter. Why <laughs> are these, why are these ostrich shells or the egg shells better um, than using radiocarbon dating techniques uh, for this kind of research? Yeah, so radiocarbon or um, carbon-14 techniques are typically limited to dating things that are about 50,000 or so years old. So this this other method, this uranium thorium method, it really allows for both more precise dating, but also for older things. We're talking about 100,000 years ago and more. Um, it's more precise. It also, again, is, is more used for things that contain calcium carbonate like egg shells. So this was a really nice specific technique to get us this really cool information. All right, so the Morton Arboretum just released the results of its 2020 tree census for the Chicago region. What were their findings? So this is cool because this is the, the the census of 2010. We think about the human census, it's somewhat similar. So this is the first follow-up from that study um, and found that the region in Chicago has more trees than it did in 2010. So it went from 157 million to about 170. Um, but unfortunately also found that there's an invasive species that is making up the largest fraction of trees. So a tree that's not normally um, supposed to be here is spreading rapidly and degrading some of our native ecosystems. And they say that trees provide more than $416 million in benefits to residents. Um, how do they come up with that number? And what are the most important benefits that trees provide in the 30 seconds we have left? Yeah, this is just a great reminder that trees aren't just beautiful. Um, we're so excited spring is here and they're coming back out, but they really are important contributors to our ecosystem. Um, so this functional value, as it's called, is calculated by thinking, looking at how much carbon is sequestered, right? We know trees pull CO2 from the atmosphere, how they help avoid runoff, um, reduce energy costs, and also help in removing pollution. So um, that's quite a significant contribution to the ecosystem that translates into real dollars. And it can just be nice to, you know, sit in the shade of a tree. My, my thanks to right. Ravi Amias for joining us as always. Thank you.